Are you ready to talk about more exciting magic cards from Modern Horizons? You're not? Well, I don't know where to go from here then. <music> Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. Welcome to another installment in my ongoing Modern Horizons set review. We have a whole bunch of interesting new cards to talk about today. So before we do that, I just want to cover that in the previous videos, I kept going on about how I had the feeling that they repurposed a lot of artwork, or at least individual pieces. Now I feel like this is pretty much an, a running theme throughout the set. So I'm probably not going to be mentioning it as much, but just so you know, a lot of the artwork in this set was, was created a while back and is finally seeing the light of day. So that's why we have some incongruency when it comes to the flavor of the card combined with the art and the mechanics. So let us dive into the cards. We have Aria of Flame to start with. Now, this is an enchantment that's one red, two colorless. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent gains 10 life. That's a crazy amount of life to be given your opponent. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you put a verse counter on Aria of Flame, then it deals damage equal to the number of verse counters on it to target player or planeswalker. So it seems like a pretty strong card. And if you play this with cards that shut off life gain, the most recent example of that would be Tybalt from War of the Spark. When you combine it with cards like that, all of a sudden, it just seems like all upside. The artwork is just what kind of looks like a volcanic winds kind of swirling up out of a magma vent in the ground or something. Again, remember what I said about repurposed artwork. This definitely feels this way. But overall, this feels like a pretty decent card. They call the set Modern Horizons, but in all honesty, when you go and look over the marketing materials, it says, hey, this is a brand new thing for Modern. But when you go and look at what people who were designing the set, like Mark Rosewater and also the head designer of the set have to say, it's more just like a random mishmash of things that are nostalgic, stuff that will appeal to EDH players. And uh, the head designer even used the term jank. He likes jank. So there's jank in this set. This card doesn't feel like jank. This feels like a card that has some interesting potential. Hell, there may even be situations where you actually want to give your opponent 10 life, and that, that part of the card will then be upsided to you as well. Moving on, we have one of the most exciting cards from today's spoilers for me, and that is one green, one colorless, Ayula Queen Among Bears. This is a 2-2. Of course it is, because it's a bear. Not only is it a bear, it's a legendary bear. Now, her abilities are, whenever another bear enters the battlefield under your control, you get to choose one. Either you put two plus one plus one counters on target bear, or target bear you control fights target creature you don't control. And the flavor text says, born from the oldest red cedar, nursed on the sap, nursed on the sap of the tallest spruce, coronated under the mightiest pine. And it's bo born from a red cedar? This, this bear was born from a piece of... What, what from wood what Wh what either way this is awesome in all honesty this this card is fantastic and there's at least one other card in the set that it's going to combine quite nicely with now that card should also be on the spoiler list so we'll just leave it for now but either way i like this guy i like it honestly or this girl as you would have it two two for two with some nice abilities not too shabby at all and the artwork shows what looks like a pretty regal bear so this one works for me. Moving on, we've got, oh, well, who, who would have thought this was gonna happen? Here's a card that combines with her. Ayula's Influence, surprise, surprise. Three green enchantment, discard a land, create a two, two green bear creature token. Ayula's runic claw marks ensure her territories are never left defenseless. So I guess these bears spring up out of the claw marks of Ayula. That is pretty cool. Ayula, more like Irula. <laughs> so this card is connected to Seismic Assault in a way. The card that would let you pitch lands to do two damage to any target. Instead, you make a 2-2 bear token. And in all honesty, it feels like Ayula's influence would be kind of dumb when you actually have Ayula out. It feels like you could get some nice mileage out of it and beef up your creatures. Now, I'm definitely not scratching my ankle right now. I'm just leaning forward to, uh, to get closer because I don't think that we get close enough. You know, that, that's... That's definitely what's going on. Either way, I like this card. Is it super strong? Eh, 
it's combolicious. I'll give you that. It's combolicious. And I would play it in a green tower just because you have something to do when you start to get lands late game. Just pitch, 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 pitch. Who cares, right? Not too shabby. Next up, we've got Bizarre Trade Mage. One blue, two colorless for a 3-4 flyer. When Bizarre Trade Mage enters the battlefield, draw two cards, then discard three cards. He traded a lamp for a scepter, the scepter for a ruby, and the ruby for a simple rug. I don't think it's a simple rug. It, it's a flying carpet, for God's sakes. That's not a simple rug. No one would market a rug that can fly as a simple rug. Get out of here with your nonsense. So this card is a nod to the Bazaar of Baghdad, which is a land that has the same ability. You tap to activate it, and then you draw two cards and discard three cards. So that's a nod to that. The artwork, I actually really like the artwork here. It's got a lot of nice colors going on. It almost looks like a bird of paradise flying up there above this trade mage. And the 3-4 flyer is a nod to the old Serendibs as well. So this has, this has some nice nostalgic feel to it. And the whole card ties together in a way where I don't go, okay, the flavor feels off. So this one's, this one's cool. It doesn't feel too weak or too strong. It comes right in the middle for me. Next up, we've got Changeling Outcast. One black for a 1-1 one, one Changeling Shapeshifter. Uh, so it's all, it's all creature types because it's a Changeling. And Changing Outcast can't block and can't be blocked. A Mercurial Face sows Distrust. Distrust reaps a lonely life. And it's got those wads of poison coming off of it that we have seen in previous videos. And I talked about how this didn't really feel like the Changeling kind of thing, but this is one of the ways they're showing, showing Changelings in this set. This is definitely repurposed artwork that was never originally meant to be Changelings. I feel like it's actually meant to be more along the lines of fading or vanishing counters, truthfully. That's the way that this feels to me. Either way, you've got you've got this feeling of age, this old man, he feels he feels tired, but also kind of relentless, like he'll never stop. Overall, the card's muddy in terms of flavor to me. It doesn't really fit flavorfully, and it's a it's a whatever card. After that, we've got Feaster of Fools. Two black, four colorless for a three three demon. It's got Convoke, your creatures can upcast this spell. Each, obviously that reduces them by however many creatures you tap to cast it. Interesting to see that on a demon. It's got Flying and Devour too. Convoke and Devour. You would honestly expect to see this more on a green creature. But anyways, well, Devour, when it enters the battlefield, you can sacrifice any number of creatures and this creature comes into the battle with twice, the battlefield, with twice as many plus one, plus one counters. So if you sack two creatures to it, it's coming with four plus one plus one counters on it it's it's definitely it's definitely interesting and i mean it's got a it's got a very heavy flavor to it in all honesty this whole thing works if you look at the artwork you can see him like crushing some kind of priest in his hand getting ready to eat them the idea that you would have a bunch of mages coming around and performing a ritual to summon up a demon and then the demon devouring them to gain strength that all works this card is actually tied together very very well I don't know about the actual power level of the card at six mana. It's a kind of a whatever, but flavor-wise, they knocked it out of the park here. It's, it's well done in that regard. Next up, we've got Force of Virtue. Two white and two colorless. This is the white part of the cycle that says you can play this on your opponent's turn by removing a card of the right color from your hand. So you can remove a white card from your hand to play this during your opponent's turn, it's an enchantment that has flash. Obviously, it would need to to be able to play, be played during your opponent's turn. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Where divinity leads, victory follows. Silver blade motto. Not too shabby. You can see an angel flying above a mass of soldiers, pointing with the sword like charge into battle. You can see, honestly, this feels, I mean, considering how prevalent the angel is, like how, how much the artwork is focused on the angel, Clearly, this was originally meant to be an angel that maybe makes like soldier tokens or something like that. But uh, in, in this regard, the artwork still works. You can see uh, like the army's being guided by an angel and that's what's giving the plus one plus one to everything. So it's not 100% with the flavor, but overall it's not too shabby. It's a nod to the old days of things like crusade and more specifically angelic voices, really. Angelic voices is something that I think of when you look at the casting cost. So, I mean, this is better than Angelic Voices, truthfully. Let us move on. Next up, we've got Frost Walk, Frost Walk, Frost Walk Bastion. This is a snow land that taps to add a colorless mana. For one and a snow mana, until end of turn, it becomes a 2-3 construct artifact creature. 
it's still a land. And whenever Frostwalk Bastion deals combat damage to a creature, tap that creature and it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So the concept is supposed to be this is a fortress that can animate and help defend the lands. I'm not exactly sure how it dealing damage ends up making so creatures don't untap, but I mean, that's tied. It's the frost walk. I guess you're supposed to think it freezes them to death. Maybe it's like, or freezes them not to death, but freezes them into immobility. Maybe it's a gigantic metal base that when it comes into contact with them, super freezes people. I don't know. Overall, it doesn't seem too shabby. It doesn't seem amazing in terms of a man land, but for an uncommon man land, it's passable. I'll give it a pass. And it is a snow land, and it's always nice to have more lands that produce snow mana. Next up, we've got Generous Gift. One white, two colorless, destroyed target permanent. Its controller creates a 3-3 green elephant creature token. The best presents are impossible to re-gift. This is a fairly amusing card, in all honesty. It's pretty funny to see that the elephant has crushed a random creature one of these one of these courtiers here has been crushed and that represents oh look you destroy this permanent you get the elephant that's kind of fun it um it honestly feels like unstable artwork this feels like artwork that was meant for an unta unstable set originally or some kind of unset and uh, here we have it but it is fun the flavor is interesting and it is just them redoing beast within they just color shifted beast within straight over to being a white card. They didn't even change it to a 3-3 white elephant token, which is weird because Magic the Gathering has elephant tokens that are not elephant tokens, has white elephants. So it doesn't make sense why this wouldn't be one, but hey, whatever. Overall, the card's not too shabby. Beast Within's pretty strong, and this gives white the ability to handle any kind of permanence. You can even destroy a planeswalker with you. You'd be like, suck in into elephant. After that, Genesis. This is a pretty decent reprint, in all honesty. One green and four colors for a 4-4 four, four incarnation. At the beginning of your upkeep, if Genesis is in your graveyard, you may pay two colors and a green. If you do, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Not Dryad, Centaur, or Avatar, but life itself. This is literally life itself. In all honesty, I like the artwork for this. This sort of like centaur made out of branches and trees with glowing golden energy flowing between its hands this most likely was not ever meant to be genesis artwork but it feels really good it feels right it's got a, it's got kind of a regal feel to it a high energy life feel to it and it's deep in the woods i like it i like it a lot genesis is a really solid card so this is just an all-around good reprint then we've got glacial revelation one green two colorless Reveal the top six cards of your library. You may put any number of snow permanents, snow permanent cards from among them into your hand. Put the rest into your graveyard. The harshest environments offer the greatest opportunities for exploration. What? Okay, that flavor text is dumb. That, how does that, like, the greatest opportunities for exploration? Dangerous places are great to explore. Come on, kids, let's go down to the needle-filled quarry and do some exploring. I don't know, pal. I don't know. I don't want to go down to Rusty McStab Hole. Thank you very much. All right. So, I mean, overall, you get to dig six card deep, and you could get a fair number of permanents in one go. So this doesn't feel like a terrible card, but it is just limited to snow permanents. So it's fairly restricted. The artwork is pretty interesting, honestly. Just, uh, you, I mean, the, you got the swirling ice around it. This is supposed to be like kind of scrying through ice magic, which I like the concept of. I really love the colors of this artwork specifically. The aquamarine, teal, whatever like different shades we have. I'm no color expert. Either way, it looks great, but the artwork also makes the flavor text sound kind of goofy. The harshest environments offer the greatest opportunities for exploration. She's just standing there, letting stuff swirl around her. That's not really exploring, all right? So, me, me. Moving on. Mother Bear. Oh, yeah. One green, one colors for a 2 2 bear. Five mana. Exile it from your graveyard. Create two green bear creature tokens. Activate this ability only, time you could cast, only at a time you could cast a sorcery. Even without her, the cubs will always know their mother's love. Will they? Will they really? She seems to be wandering off on them, like, whatever, I don't care. The bears are like in the back, Mama, don't leave me! It's like, Mama, don't love. Mama, don't love you. Life is a mo bear. <laughs> Next up, Mox. We've got a Mox, a tantalizing Mox. 
You know what's funny is I was like, I don't even know what tantalite is. So I looked up tantalite and it's like, tantalite is this kind of, this kind of element. And it's like, okay. And it's most strongly connected to names another element that I don't even know. And I'm like, okay, whatever, whatever. I'm not even gonna bother trying to bring this knowledge to my video because I don't know it. So I ain't gonna worry about it. So what do we get for this mox? Well, it's got suspend three. So we're looking at an old time spiral ability. It taps for a man of any color but you've got to wait three turns to get it out. So even if you have it on the first like turn and you play it, you're not actually gonna to get to benefit from it until the fourth turn, but it is still in box and it does cost you nothing. And it does tap for a man of any color. And that is all pretty impressive in my books. And the artwork is absolutely fantastic. In all honesty, I really love the artwork. I like the, I like the sphere that's floating there above what looks like, it basically looks like something you would see in a bridge, like the arch that you would see supporting a bridge, kind of all broken, but it's it's set up instead as like a cradle, but the actual mox floats above it with nothing connecting it, giving that kind of magical, mystical feel. And I like the fact that it's being kept in like a darkened room where the only light is in the center where the mox is. Honestly, this card has genuine potential. I mean, it, it's 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 a mox. When do they make moxes that suck? That doesn't happen. So this card is going, people are going to want this card. There's no doubt about it. The fact that it taps for a man of any color is dumb, son. It's dumb. Next up, Pyrophobia. One red, one colorless. Pyrophobia deals three damage to target creature. Cowards can't block this turn. <sighs> when I read this part of the card before, like when I was getting the spoilers together, I went, wait, what? What's going on here? Why are you making cowards can't block this turn a thing when cowards not being able to block is like tied into like one card and there aren't really cowards in magic, so it's kind of stupid. How is like, it, it's, it deals three damage to a creature only at sorcery speed and makes it so cowards can't block. That's stupid. The only thing that saves this card from being absolute trash is the flavor text. It says, I hate this. I hate fire. I hate you for taking me on this road. I hate this. I hate fire. I hate you for taking me on this route. Norin the Wary. The problem is it doesn't look like Norin the Wary in the artwork, does it? It doesn't look like Norin the Wary at all. I love Norin the Wary and I like his quotes, but it doesn't make sense to me to quote him on a card where he's not on it and they show somebody else. It's like just so random things. Like on other Norin the Wary cards, it has a quote from him, but it'll just be like, here's the... Here's the Jade statue or whatever. You know, I know it weren't no ordinary hunk of rock. That kind of thing. So I don't know. I don't I don't know why they decided to put a Nor in the Wary quote on a card that doesn't have Nor in the Wary. It's the card is underwhelming to say the least. Seeing this guy running through a fire field, it's pretty good artwork. Honestly, if they hadn't attributed it to Nor in the Wary, it would probably make it better because the flavor text is enjoyable. It's just attributing it to Nor in the Wary. It's like, yeah, I get it. It's a nod to Nor in the Wary, but nor in the way he wouldn't get himself in this scenario. So I, if they should have just had the flavor text say, I hate this, I hate fire, I hate you for taking me on this route, and it would have been better. Moving on, Ravenous Giant, otherwise known as Juzum Dijin, brought back. Two red, two colors for a 5-5. Five, five. At the beginning of your upkeep, it deals one damage to you. The might of an army with the restraint of a child. And if you take a look at its artwork, and you take a look at the Juzum's artwork, there are definitely some real similarities on top of the mechanical similarities. I mean, it's identical. It's it's really, it's it's a color shifted Juzum, who we kidding? So, I mean, by today's standards, it's it's not very good. This is not a good card. It's a whatever, but it's a nice nod to the Juzum. Moving on, we've got Regrowth. This is a standard reprint. We've seen it a bunch of times already. Regrowth, one green, one colorless. Return target card from your graveyard to your hand. While the root remains, the tree yet lives. All right. Sure, flavor text is okay, I guess. It's like, all right, whatever. I mean, the, the artwork's pretty literal. It's you're, you're regrowing a tree. I like the artwork, and I like regrowth. It's, it's one of my favorite old-school green cards, in all honesty. So to see them bring it into modern sits totally fine with me. They've made a ton of cards since then that let you get cards back from your graveyard in a similar method to regrowth. So to me, this feels like a perfectly fine addition to the modern format. Next up, we've got a card that makes someone like me very happy. Scale up. One green sorcery. Until end of turn, target creature you control becomes a green worm with base power and toughness 6-4. I love it for one green. And it's got overload, which is the ability we saw back in the Ravnica days, where it says you can cast this spell for its overload cost 
If you do, change its text by replacing all instances of target with each. So if you pay the overload cost, all your creatures turn into six four worms. And this is a nod to the old school craw worms, which I love to play with back in the day, making all your creatures craw worms. I like it. I like the flavor of it. I like that you can see a worm just smashing through a village. It gives the idea of all of a sudden some like small like gutter rat or something being converted into a giant worm and just ripping through, causing a bunch of mayhem and descending to try and eat people based on its wormy instincts. Love it. Then we've got Sisse Weatherlight Captain. Now this is weird to me because they did Sisse already in Invasion, so I wasn't expecting this. And at first I went, wait, you can't do that. And then I said, oh, actually, this presents the opportunity for us to see more reimagined versions of famous characters. And I'm okay with that. So Sisse Weatherlight Captain, one white, two colorless. Sisse gets plus one, plus one for each color among other legendary permanents you control. So if you had somebody, let's say, for example, you had Arvad from Dominaria, he's white black. So she would get two plus one plus ones from that and Arvad's bonus, which would actually give her plus four plus four, already bring her up to six power, which is really useful because her second ability is pay one mana of every color, search your library for a legendary permanent card with converted mana cost less than Sisse's power and put that card directly onto the battlefield. So if she had six power, you could go through your deck for any legendary permanent that costs six or less and put it straight onto the board without having to pay to cast it. That's pretty amazing. And I like the fact that the one of each color makes me think of the legacy weapon and the legacy weapon is tied into the ship that Sisse now, like, uh, was the captain for. So that all is tied together pretty nicely. In all honesty, I kind of wish they had done something a little different with her artwork wise because there feels like a lot of similarity between the two Sisses, truthfully. There doesn't seem a lot like a lot of variants. But hey, overall, this is good artwork. The card itself is pretty neat. It seems like it's something that's going to excite EDH and Commander players, which there are a bunch of uh, cards like that in these sets, in all honesty. But overall, I give it a thumbs up. After that, we've got Splicer's Skill. Now, this is an interesting one. One white and two colors. Create a 3-3 three, three colorless golem artifact creature token, but it's got splice onto instant or sorcery. Now, before splice only existed on cards that were specifically arcane, right? Like uh, you had things like Glacial Ray, where it's like splice onto arcane. And what splice does is it allows you to add the effects of this card that you're splicing onto another card. So this card feels like it could be silly if you were to splice it onto something. Like you could splice it onto a storm card and then the storm, each storm copy would actually also have this attached to it, which is kind of a funky idea. I'm going to fluster storm. Oh, by the way, for every copy of fluster storm, I get a three, three colors golem as well. What? And the splicers, if you didn't know, were creatures from when Mirrodin got taken over by Phyrexia. You had all kinds of different splicers like the mall splicer that would make three, three golems and give them abilities. So this is a nod both to the Kamigawa block and to new Phyrexia as well. After that, we've got a reprint that's gonna make a lot of people happy. Squirrel Nest, two green and a colorless enchant land. It had the enchanted land has tap, create a one, one green squirrel creature token. In the treetops, unseen by many, lurks chittering, skittering, death. I like this artwork a fair bit. It's kind of funny, the contrast between talking about love, chittering, skittering death and you can just see a happy little squirrel just kind of sitting up in his tree like, what's up, bro? What's up, bro? This is a card that people like to combine with Earthcraft when they're being dirty for infinite squirrels. But I mean, Earth, it's, it's not something you can play in tournaments. It's something you can only play when you're being like a casual tabletop. You're going to get it, boy. But either way, Squirrel Nest is a fun card. Being able to generate a creature for free every turn is pretty potent. And the fact that it enchants a land means it's really difficult to get rid of because you either need enchantment removal, which isn't available to all colors, or land destruction, which is a lot more scarce than it used to be. So overall, this is a good card with some really nice artwork. It looks like the world that these squirrels are from is a very beautiful, pastoral kind of just, the, the, the nice green rolling hills. It looks like it would be a beautiful place to visit. Somewhere that would be nice to just lay in the grass and look up at the sky and contemplate how nice life is. That's the feeling I get from this card. I, I, de I definitely enjoy this artwork. <laughs> uh, next up, we've got Thundering Dijin. One red, one blue, three colorless for a three, four flyer. Whenever it attacks, it deals damage to any target equal to the number of cards you've drawn this turn. It strikes like a bolt from a brainstorm. Ugh, that flavor text is awful. 
That it strikes like a bolt from a brainstorm, and it's like, is someone letting is someone letting their kids write flavor text? This is terrible. Don't you get it though? Brainstorm's an old magic card, and so is Bolt. We did it! We did it! Confetti and party time, we did it! So yeah, five mana for a three, four flyer. Whenever it attacks, it deals damage to a target equal to the number of cards you've drawn. So it's all right, it's okay, but it's nothing special. It doesn't make me go, woo, Lordy McGlordy. Next up, we've got Umazawa's Charm. One black, one colorless, it's an instant. Choose one, target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. Target creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn, or you gain two life. Be ever loyal to your own best interests. Okay, and so this is a play on his his equipment, Umazawa's Jeet, which is a crazy old school, well, roughly old school, somewhere in the middle of magic, because it comes from Betrayers of Kamigawa. But it's an older piece of equipment that was dumb and busted because they didn't they didn't realize what they were doing when they made it. So they screwed up pretty large. And the card was oppressive. Super, super oppressive. Now, my nitpick with this card is, sure, you've got you've got what looks like you can say that's Umazawa, and you can say, oh, look at me, I've got I've got I've got my weapon. But where's the charm? It's just it's just blood on his weapon. There's no actual charm. Normally, when we have a charm card, there's something to represent the charm. There's literally nothing in this artwork to represent the charm. It, it should have been Umazawa's something else, like Umazawa's trick or something like that, because the char there's nothing here to say charm. Like there's just there's a bunch of glowing motes behind him, but that actually looks like glowing trees or something, or maybe spirits off in the distance. But there's nothing in this artwork that says to me, hey, there's actually a charm here. So that that part to me is a fail. In terms of strength of the card, I mean you've got three options. You can use to boost a creature, give a creature a minus, or gain a life, but they're in such small serving amounts that it doesn't really feel good enough. Do you know what I mean? Like for the two mana, I especially, especially in modern, it definitely, it do, it just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like it's strong enough. So it is what it is. But that's all the cards we have to review today, my friends. So at this point, I'm going to roll the golden scroll. These are the people at my back on Patreon or through channel memberships, and we're welcoming some new members today. We are welcoming Ragnar Eiswind. Thanks for joining up to my channel membership, brother. Appreciate it. I know it was a bit of a struggle to make it work, but it happened in the end. And we are also welcoming aboard Snowbuddy. So thanks, Snowbuddy, for joining my Patreon. Glad to have you on the Golden Scroll. Now, now that we've covered all the goodness there, talked about all that fun, it's time for me to end this. So thanks for being here, and for now, I'm history, baby. <laughs>